Welcome to Unit 11, Video 1, Solution Formation. By the end of this video, you should know the difference between the solute and the solvent in a solution. You should recognize that there are a variety of types of solutions. You should understand the three steps in solution formation and the energy changes associated with each step. A solution is a homogeneous mixture of two or more substances in a single state. Recall that mixtures are physical combinations of substances that are not chemically combined. In a solution, the particles are very small, so you can't see them. Imagine salt water. You can't see the salt particles in the water. Likewise, the particles are uniformly distributed. If you take a sample of a drop of salt water from one portion of the sample and a drop from another portion of the sample, they should have the same ratio of salt to water. The particles also will not separate, no matter how long you let it sit. If you have a solution of salt water and you let it sit on the table for days and days, the salt will never separate from the water, unless, of course, the water evaporates. But if no evaporation occurs, the salt will never separate from the water. There's some important vocabulary that goes along with solutions. The solute is the substance that gets dissolved. It usually undergoes this phase change from solid to aqueous. A most common example is NaCl. NaCl in salt water is the solute because it dissolves in water. The solvent is the substance that does the dissolving. Water is the most common example and the one that we'll deal with pretty much exclusively in this class. Again, you dissolve the solute in the solvent. Substances that will dissolve in a particular solvent are said to be soluble. Substances that will not dissolve are said to be insoluble. So NaCl is soluble in water. Sand is insoluble in water. It's a common misconception that solutions only involve the dissolving of a solid in a liquid. Here you can see there's a whole list of different types of solutions that exist, from gas and gas solutions like air, to solid and solid solutions, like alloys such as sterling silver or brass. The most common solutions are solids dissolved in liquids, which is what we're going to focus on in this class. You, you've also probably seen gas dissolved in liquid if you, if you uh, drink seltzer a lot, or any type of soda. That's just CO2 gas dissolved in whatever the substance is, the water for seltzer, or the soda for something like Coke or 7-Up or something. Many of these types of solutions have particular names. For instance, solid solutions containing two or more solids are called alloys. An alloy is a uniform mixture of two or more metals that are physically combined, not chemically bonded. A gaseous solution obviously contains two or more gases. Anytime you put gases in the same container, they will always form a solution. Recall that gases take up the, sh the space of their container. So if more than one gas are both taking up the entire volume of a container, they will be evenly distributed and will qualify as a solution. Air, therefore, is a solution. Liquid solutions have a liquid solvent and a solid liquid or gas solute. Liquids that can mix with each other are said to be miscible instead of soluble. Liquids that cannot mix are immiscible. So oil is immiscible in water, but vinegar is miscible in water. The solutions we'll be dealing with mostly in this class are aqueous solutions. These are any solutions that have water as a solvent. Recall that the solute can be ionic or covalent, and we've already seen that ionic solutes separate or dissociate upon dissolving to produce electrolytes or solutions that conduct electricity. Here you see a dissociation equation for NaCl in water, where the ions have separated or dissociated. Covalent substances, however, do not dissociate. The molecules separate, but they do not break apart. Therefore, these solutions are non-electrolytes. There are no charged particles in solution. Here we see an equation for the dissolving of sugar down the bottom. C6H12O6 solid becomes C6H12O6 aqueous. Notice the atoms have stayed, in, stayed together. The molecule does not come apart. So why do solutions form? Well, let's focus on ionic solutes. Take NaCl, for example. 
NaCl dissolves in water because the attractions between the charged Na plus and Cl minus ions and the polar water molecules are actually stronger than the attractions between the ions themselves. Therefore, water molecules are able to surround each individual ion and separate it from the crystal. This process is called solvation. It's the interaction between the solute and the solvent particles. If the solvent is water, this process is specifically called hydration, which is what we'll call it in this class since we're always dealing with water solutions. Here's a picture where we see the positive Na plus ion in yellow being surrounded by the negative ends of the polar water molecules. On the, on the right, you see the negative chloride ion in green being surrounded by the positive ends of the water molecules. This is what hydration looks like. Solution formation occurs in three basic steps. First, the attractions between the solute particles must be broken. If the solute is an ionic compound, these attractions are ionic bonds. If it's a molecular compound, these attractions are intermolecular forces. This is an endothermic process. Energy must be put in to break apart the solute particles. Then the intermolecular forces in the solvent are overcome to make room for the solute. In other words, if the solvent is water, the hydrogen bonds are overcome to separate the water molecules from one another. This is also an endothermic process because energy must be put in to overcome the IMFs. And finally, the solute and the solvent interact to form a solution. This process is exothermic. It's a, it's a release of energy that occurs when the solute and the solvent interact. If we consider these steps together, in cases where more energy must be put in to accomplish steps one and two than is released by step three, then the overall dissolving process will absorb thermal energy. It will be an overall endothermic process. On the other hand, when less energy is required for steps one and two than is released by step three, the dissolving process will release thermal energy. It will be an overall exothermic dissolving process. Here's two graphics indicating what this would look like. Let's look first at the exothermic graphic on the left. Here you see the purple arrows representing the energy that goes in for steps one and two. Notice the sum of the two purple arrows is still less than the red arrow indicating the amount of energy released when the solute and the solvent particles interact. Therefore, this is an exothermic process. More energy is released than went in. On the right, we see an endothermic solution formation. Here, the purple arrows representing the energy going in for steps one and two are much larger than the red arrow representing the energy that comes out in step three. Therefore, this is an overall endothermic dissolving process. That brings us to the end of this video. Let's review our goals. First, we looked at the difference between the solute and the solvent. We said that the solute dissolves in the solvent. Then we looked at a variety of types of solutions, focusing mostly on aqueous solutions, solutions where water is the solvent. Then we looked at the three steps in solution formation and the energy change associated with each step. 